This dog texted me that he had a problem with his couch. So I called him back and asked, how bad is it? He said, rough. Here's a brief tech tip. We had some plastic panels that we needed to change from blue to this very flat matte black. Of course, we used our cleaning step aggressively with the gray scuff pad. We did a prep with alcohol. We did a prep with acetone. We put two light coats of adhesion promoter and of course since this was plastic we used our plastic primer as our base for our pigments and here is our target vinyl a very matte black vinyl and this is what we came up with so we're looking pretty good there but the tip is this Whenever we add the flattener to our paints, and you know the plastic primer is very glossy uh, by default. And so we're going to add flattener to our total mix to get this matte finish. And what I like to do is double strain it. Uh, if you single strain it then uh, you might find some white specks occasionally from the flattener that will show up on black more than it shows up on anything else so just plan on double straining all of your very ultra matte finishes so these are the pictures we were sent by the customer and let's imagine that you and i are here looking at these pictures for the first time and trying to make an assessment of the problem. What would you venture to say about this couch? That it looked like a peeling urethane, a delaminating urethane finish. Yes. Much like this picture sent to me by another individual. I had to explain, however, that this was peeling because he didn't understand the word delamination. So we might want to be careful with that word when we're speaking to the public. He was imagining that he could buy some goop off the internet and that would solve his problem. So, of course, we're not going to help him with that. For the job that we are doing, we had the customer pick out a material that was of the right grain and of the right color that they would be happy with to most closely match their furniture. And we ordered a yard of that. Weighing all the factors that come into play, the customer decided to replace this one section and extend the life of the couch just a little bit more. Thankfully, this is the center portion of a sectional, so it easily separated from the rest of the couch. And the single edge razor blade here will work fine to separate this seam all around the perimeter. And as you might have noticed, we've moved from the shop into the office. So it's a more comfortable environment to work in. And since I'm a very important person, I have a very big office and I can bring a piece of furniture in here any time that I get permission. Of course, we're going to break this entire job up into sections. So we'll only be hand stitching for a half hour or an hour at a time, whatever's comfortable for us and spread this out over the number of days. We have to be careful to leave this valley anchored down to the frame. 
And so we're cutting on only the bad piece of material. We're not cutting on the seam here. Everything in that seam holds that piece down in the cushion. So by just trimming on the bad piece alone, we save that contour. Now we're going to tie into the good piece. Uh, it'll be up a little bit higher from the seam that exists now, but at least we will still have that valley. That's the plan. Here we can see this cheap felt material with the urethane laminated over top. And it's coming apart. There is no fix for this. It is a terminal cancer. And there's nothing retail wise that we can do to help the customer other than replace it. We want to make sure to take exact measurements here. So this is 13 and 3 eighths minus, we had it on the one mark on the other seam, so that's 12 and 3 eighths. And let's not forget to mark down our seam allowance. Our objective is to measure every dimension precisely seam to seam. That way our repair panel will be in the same tension as the original panel was. And so we've transferred all of our dimensions, including the seam allowance, to our new panel. Now before sewing those ribs together, I want to make sure that I have proper tension on my thread coming through the machine. And you can double check that by looking at the bottom side and the top side and see if any of the other thread is coming through to the opposite side. Tension looks good here. And looking here, none of the top thread is coming down to the bottom and none of the bottom thread is coming up to the top. And of course, whatever seam allowance you measured for, you must use up 100% of that seam allowance as it goes through the machine. In this case, one half inch. After this, we'll change our thread color to match the original top stitch thread and we'll make sure it's the proper distance from our blind stitch. This is one where both pieces of our salvage underneath are folded to one side. That's where the top stitch goes. If you did not have access to a sewing machine, you could put this insert in without these ribs. The couch would be every bit as functional. Of course, it's nice to keep the design there if we can. Here we're marking the center point for the proper orientation. And then I need to make sure that I outline all of our seam allowances. Our stitches will need to fall right on the mark. So the original insert was stretched on there, tight as a drum, so you could bounce on it like a trampoline. So if our stitches fall in the precise location as original, we are going to try to by doing that, restore the same tension in our insert.
I've decided to mark out a quarter inch for each of my stitches, especially in that seam down in the valley. And I want to mark for the stitches on the adjoining piece. I am starting at the center line here with a double needle blind stitch. This is going to be the toughest spot because it's hard to reach down in here. We want to get as deep down in that valley as we can with our stitches. So uh, it's a bit of a, a struggle, especially for the first couple of stitches. And this will wear your fingers out more than these straight lines down the side. But it's doable. And now with the fabric held in place a little bit, starting from the center and going in the other direction is a little bit easier. So we finished up with the most critical part, that deep seam down in the valley, and it's looking pretty good. It'll be much easier from here. Here I'm anchoring the center point at the back just to keep everything even. In getting started down the side, I'm going a few stitches back to the good on the original stitch line, and then incorporating my new piece. Now we have technicians out there with a variety of backgrounds and often I get some pushback when I use hand sewing thread and they may have had experience using something else like maybe their father used to use fishing line or something and that's what they recommend. But we want to be open to what works now. It could be fishing line was all we had at one time. In fact, if you remember when we used to use the single needle stitch that we used a waxed artificial sinew in order to do our stitching. Well, we've left that behind now in favor of the hand sewing thread, which is a heavier duty thread than you would use typically in a sewing machine. By virtue of the name, there must be something to it. Of course, you want to be respectful to your dad and say, look, uh, I understand that you used that at that time. Uh, However, we have something new that works better, and I knew you would want me to progress. And I've decided to round the corner and pre-punch some holes just to make this corner a little bit easier to handle. Speaking of dads, my dad used to recite this poem. It goes this way, the first part of it. There once was a thing that couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that at least he'd be one who wouldn't say so until he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face, and if he worried, he hid it. And he started to sing as he tackled that thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. How ironic that I seem to be making a living out of figuring out ways to fix things that other people say can't be done. In fact, this was another one of those circumstances where the customer had searched everywhere for somebody to fix her couch and no one was willing to offer any help. And then she was talking to a lady that was refinishing a hutch. And Wanda told her, Check with Rick. If he can't do it, nobody can. <laughs> so why am I doing this job? Wanda put me on the spot. <laughs> She's quite the craftsperson herself. Uh, this is a hutch that she was working on for the lady when she recommended me. So that's looking pretty good. We're going to get a start down the other side next. 
And as before, we want to get started back a few stitches to the good on the original panel, on the original seam, and then incorporate our new piece into that. If you haven't watched my earlier videos on the double needle blind stitch, then you may not uh, understand the importance of how to hold the needle and how that will enable you to do stitching that you thought that previously you couldn't do. Now I've even done some one-on-one -on -one training where I've tried to help folks to hold the needle properly, but they refuse to do so and then they struggle with the stitch and they break a needle which is easy to do by the way. So the earlier videos that I did illustrate how you need to let the needle follow the curve of your forefinger in order to support the needle along the way. So pay close attention to how you hold the needle. It'll make your job so much easier in the long term. Another thing to consider when doing long stints of stitching over time is if your body is contorted into a position that makes it easier for you to stitch, you may not realize, but you can be in one position uh, for 10 or 15 minutes and you could hurt yourself. So be careful, get up, stretch, and uh, save some stitching for the next session. So set limits on the time you're going to spend stitching. Save your body and your fingers in particular for the next day or for the next session. It's not visible here, but I did use a ratchet strap to compress the foam for a little bit of the way here to relieve some of this tension. It was the same strap that we used in part one. When the panels are not in tension, it's easy to get a nice tight stitch as we did in part one. It's very much like sewn on the sewing machine. So typically the 80 stitches down one side will share the tension when you pull the piece tight. The risk in our job is that we are pulling each stitch tight. And so each individual stitch shares a good bit of the tension of the whole piece. The risk for us is that our stitching might be slightly visible because the piece is under tension as we're stitching it along. And we can find that same thing in any seam that's under high tension. So we can mitigate that somewhat by compressing the foam cushion as we sew along as much as possible. And this is where we put the last block in the wall. Thanks for watching. We have one more example reserved for part three in our series. And by that time, hopefully we can come to a better consensus for the two dilemmas that we brought up in part one, where the public says we can't find anybody to fix our couch. And the texts say, we can't make money fixing furniture anymore. And we're definitely going to make a rebuttal to the people say that it can't be done.